Hello and welcome to your daily writing habit. If you are writing a book or thinking about it, or maybe you've started writing your book but you're having some trouble finishing it, you are in the right place. I'm your host, Christine Whitmarsh. If you're looking for me online, look up Christine Inc. I-N-K, like the stuff you write with. You can visit me online at christine-inc.com. Each day, I am sharing with you the writing habits I've learned over my 18 years as a ghostwriter, book coach, and author. I have found that three things in particular have a huge impact on your success as an author. They are writing fundamentals, productivity, and mindset habits. Well, good morning, everyone, and I am so excited to have a special guest here on your daily writing habit, USA Today and Amazon, best-selling author of over 30 books, Rebecca Forster, longtime friend as well. And here's a little bit about her. I'm a huge fan of Rebecca, by the way. I just love her Josie Bates and Witness series. So here's a little bit about her. After earning her MBA, Rebecca Forster spent 14 years as a marketing executive before taking the leap from a corporate to a creative career. A full-time author, speaker, and teacher, Rebecca focuses on legal and political thrillers, but is known for bringing an uncommon sense of character and compassion to her work. Her Witness series featuring attorney Josie Bates has resided on the Amazon bestseller list for over three years in both the U.S. and U.K. and is a featured series at audible.com. Before Her Eyes, a cross-genre thriller, captured the winning votes for reviewer's choice for best mystery. And the CBS legal correspondent calls Rebecca's books perfect, impossible to put down. Thank you so much for being here today, Rebecca. I'm excited. I am too. I tell you, I don't get up early just for anyone, Christine. <laughs> I was going to say, it's super early out there on the West Coast. We're, we're doing the bi-coastal <laughs> thing this morning. <laughs> no, I'm thrilled to be here and talk about one of my all-time favorite things, writing. I mean, it just, uh, it, it, Kindle and, and the changes in publishing have given new writers so many choices, and, and I find it incredibly exciting. Me too. You know I do. It's my life led every day. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I know mine too. <laughs> all right. So let's get to know you. Let's let my listeners get to know you. So all those years ago, way back when, what ultimately was the trigger for you for taking the leap from marketing executive to full-time novelist? Well, I have a, a rather strange uh, writing background in that I didn't always write. Um, I was working, my client was married to a rather famous author who I didn't know who she was, and I feel terrible to this day, but it was Danielle Steele. And um, I, I made a, a, just a quip to um, the lady who worked with me that, oh, I bet I could write a book. And she said, well, I dare you. And so just to save face, and you know, at the time I had no children, and um, it was it sounded like a, a really fun thing to try to do. I decided, okay, I'm going to uh, try to write a book. And lo and behold, my first one sold. But it sold because I think I did the research uh, into how you sell a book as opposed to my writing was spectacular. In fact, my first editorial letter, you could tell my writing was not spectacular. But I did learn a lot in that research of how to approach New York. Kindle was non-existent at that time, and we were talking over 30 years ago. And um, so, you know, I kind of got the fever after that first one. It's like going to Las Vegas, and you put in a quarter, and you get a jackpot, and you think, oh, if I put in 50 cents, you know, maybe I'll get more. So I, I kind of got the writing fever, and and I... I had some good luck and then started getting rejections and then had some good luck again. And it was a fascinating kind of first couple of years. And I still worked and I wrote and I had two kids. And at some point I realized, you know, I, I love this. It, I, I really had found my passion. And I made plans to do that transition from a corporate having a paycheck career into a, a sort of wild and woolly creative career. Um, and I think that was key for me is I need, I could not take a leap. I really needed to have a plan. And so I transitioned out slowly. And when I finally was writing full time, um, it was really scary, but at least I knew I had, I had a history already. I think it's very difficult to simply 
leap into a creative career. Um, there's too many variables. I think people really have to plan for that. That's excellent. I, I agree. I'm quite the planner as I sit here looking at all my planning tools all over my desk. <laughs> yeah. I plan everything. <laughs> I think actually you're a better planner than I am. But but I think when you have the basics of you you have a goal, you know, and and yeah. you have the the real foundation of what it takes to reach that goal, if you can plan for those two things and you have that that basic knowledge, I think, you know, it it soothes the soul a little bit. And also it makes your your significant other feel better that to know that you're at least you're at least thinking about making a living out of all this. Yes. And then also for me, the tools, finding the right tools to, to reach your goals. And that's something I get. I don't, I'm sure I, I'm kind of going off topic here. <clears throat> I'm sure you get this question a lot too that I get, which is what is like the perfect writing software to write a book. And the answer I always give is, you know, the one that is going, actually going to result in you writing your book and not getting so distracted by the bells and whistles of the software that you forget that you're writing a book. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do get that question. Uh, you know, I do, and the funny thing is, is uh, the only answer I have is that I just use Word. And the reason being, you're writing a book, you're telling a story. I I have a difficult time with bells and whistles. This is why I also don't do um, uh, critique groups. And I I've been into critique groups, but what I found, I need I need real simplicity. I need one voice. I truly truly believe is is in my best interest. So I use one editor um, as opposed to a critique group. And I've used her for, oh my gosh, 25 years. Even when I was traditionally published, she was my pre-editor editor for story content. And um, I just sit there with my word program because if I had things popping up all the time that said, uh, you know, let's do a character study here or let's, let's uh, do our beat sheet over here, I I would find it intimidating because I can't certain questions I can't answer even in my own book because I feel them more than intellectualize them. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Totally. Okay, Thanks good. That. And so yeah, so the the software for me, but one thing I do tell people is is if this is a very personal endeavor and you're right, whatever works for you works for you, whether it's getting up at three in the morning and writing, you know, a thousand words, or if it's working only on the weekends, or if it's having a fancy piece of software. I'm just, I'm also a big fan of, of sort of not having a lot of overhead. So especially for new writers, you know, be careful where you put your money, because, uh, you know, you're going to need it for promotion and all sorts of different things. So so software is is sort of at the bottom of my list, but for someone else, it could be critical. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that behind-the-scenes glimpse into your process, too. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're already getting into that. Sorry, Ed. I, I it's all right. To, you know, sort of like the beginning of a book, you tend to write all different things, and then suddenly you realize, oh, my gosh, characters have gone off on five different tracks, bring them back. So that's kind of like the way my brain works. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of characters, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about this because I really just think Josie Bates and your Witness series is one of just, and not just because I know you, but one of the strongest and really most interesting female characters I've ever read. So I'm curious to know what your initial vision was for your Witness series and how that kind of evolved and unfolded over the years. It, it the, the evolution has been shocking to me, frankly. Um, I wrote this uh, the first book, Hostile Witness, and intended it to be a single title, standalone book. Uh, my agent pitched it to Penguin Putnam, and they came back and said, let's make this three books. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I didn't start out with the idea of ever extending her life. Um, I had no clue what it was like to write a series. And so I of course said yes I mean if someone says that to you <laughs> you don't you don't quibble so, <laughs> so it's like okay sure let's do three books and um, I didn't really know who she was and I think that was kind of a blessing uh, I knew the basic characters and who interacted with her 
and she just grew over time and and um led me and I used to think that was sort of a silly thing for writers to say that oh I you know I'm led by my characters it felt a little pretentious but quite frankly now that I look back I realize I absolutely was um led by the situation in which I put these characters and and their voices and so what the weird thing that happened was after three books Penguin Putnam said you know what we're we're done it's not selling as well as we thought it would and this was the time of the transition where bookstores were closing do you remember that distribution channels were kind of drying up no one knew what was going really going on and Kindle was just hitting the marketplace and there was the brouhaha about oh nobody's going to want to read on an electronic device and so it was it was a real transitional time for books and I and I completely understood why they didn't want to continue with the series they had contracted for three books they were done they weren't flying off the shelves but the shelf space that was left was going to the you know, super bestsellers. You saw Stephen King doing a lot of real estate and Dean Koontz and John Grisham and all those people. So I kind of thought, oh, maybe, you know, maybe I'm retired. I don't know. I've been doing this 25 years. Maybe this is sort of a sign. And it was my husband who said, have you seen this Kindle thing? Did you know you can put your books up? And strangely, I had rights back to everything. I was always very careful about getting my rights back to all my books. So I had about 20 some books where I had the rights. And I started posting them. And then um, one day, Hostile Witness just took off. I mean, absolutely just took off. And readers started saying, you know, where's book four? And I was like, I have no idea. So after book three, one, two, and three were kind of uh, traditional legal thrillers in, in terms of courtroom drama. But what I was finding was I was much more involved in the emotional lives of these characters. And it became, once book four started, it became more of a saga where there are three main characters, and I was taking each of those characters and focusing on them with Josie always as the the hub. But what was happening then was this sort of hobbled together family she had created um, was becoming more and more real, and everybody had an emotional challenge. Everyone had a physical challenge. I if I if I could package whatever happened with that character and, and those around her, I would do it. I have tried to recreate it. And I think it just, it was just that moment, you know, that where they became so real to me that their stories kind of poured out. So, so I can't, I can't tell you that I consciously thought about her. She just became what she became. And, and it was sort of magical and it was kind of cool. And, and after all those years of writing, it was really neat to to find this sort of emotional and intellectual and um, creative home for my own brain. It it was very exciting. So obviously here I did not answer your question except to tell you that it was a <laughs> Harry Potter moment where somebody you know <laughs> waved a wand over my head and she she appeared. Um, she was based on. Just her her physical aspect was based on a judge I know who put herself through law school um, and college on a volleyball scholarship for UCLA. Uh, yeah, UCLA, I think it was not not law school, but college. And very tall, you know, blonde woman, um, very smart, uh, very kind. Um, so so there was an inspiration for this character, but I think Josie herself just kind of. Uh, took it up 10 notches on her own somehow. That's awesome. Yeah, and you totally answered my question. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> oh, that's good. How, yeah. that's yeah. how it unfolded. And it does yeah, happen. <laughs> it does. And what's so awesome is that Josie is back on December Josie 1st. Josie is when I are recording back. This. 
Well, we're at the end of October 2019, as you and I are recording this, and this episode will run at some point in November. So she's back on December 1st. I've already, I think I told you this over email, I already read your sneak peek of the first couple chapters of yes. Lost Witness, and I'm just literally on the edge of my seat. So excited, so amazing. So tell me about Lost Witness and how and when this came about. Oh, my gosh. I am, I honestly, this has cracked me up as I write, as I wrote the book, because the only reason it came about was because of the readers. And at the end of book seven, Dark Witness, I had left one character, you know, with actually I had left one character with, with an unknown future. And um, it, for me, this was fine. I thought the readers are going to love it. It's going to be a very uh, Princess Bride moment where they – ride into the sunset and the readers can decide on their own what happens to this character. Well, they didn't like it. Um, I was like, <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to use your imagination? They actually, they, they kept writing and saying, we want to know what happened to this character. And they wanted to know what I thought happened to this character. So I resisted for a long time. And finally, I just got one letter too many, one email too many. And I thought, you know what, let me, let me analyze what's going on here. And what was going on here was these characters had been so close to me and, and obviously to the readers also that I was kind of paralyzed. I didn't know there, there were a hundred roads that, that this character could take. There were a thousand ways I could, you know, continue this on. And I didn't want to really be responsible for making that choice because they were they were so real. I thought, what if I make the wrong choice? And I didn't, I, I guess for the first time with this series, I had major writer's block. I just did not know what to do. So I started to think, you know, do I, A, do I want to bring him back? And B, if he comes back, what is he going to mean to all the rest of the people in, in the show? And, um, that it was it was honestly gut wrenching, especially the the very end, because I am not a bow ending person. I just don't believe everything should be wrapped up really pretty and neatly. And I am so thrilled with the very last line of this book that I I cannot <laughs> tell you. <laughs> it it once I got into it, once I figured out what the story was going to be, I I felt really, really good about it. But it wasn't until the very, very end, and my, my editor will tell you this, that I knew how this character was going to actually fit in. And um, it, it was, oh, my God, it was gut-wrenching. I love it when things like that happen, though. When you, you honestly, every day you wake up and you think, is this going to be the right word, the right sentence, the right tone, the right everything to make the reader happy. And, and I think maybe this is what I'm really excited about when it comes out in December. Are, are the readers going to be satisfied with what happens to this character and to Josie and Archer? And Josie has, has quite a, um, she has a challenge also that I think if people don't at least shed one tear or two while they're all thrilled and excited, I will be really sad. <laughs> but there's, there's lots going on, and, and it was the only reason this book was written was because readers showed such a, a wonderful interest, and, and actually the book is dedicated to them because, because I wouldn't have done it without that push, and I wouldn't have thought that far without, without them saying we really, really – you know, want to know what's in your brain. And it's been an interesting year to figure out what was in my brain and what I owed to these characters. And and now that I've done this one, I have a feeling, I think there's going to be more in this series. I really do. Um, I, I'm not, I'm never going to say never again. <laughs> That's, that was a great lesson. That's great. And that's such a testament to something that I get a lot from, especially first time authors is who wants to read my book. And they just, they have such a hard time sometimes, you know, visualizing and imagining, you know, who out there is, is you know, reading their books, even after they do come out. And I have, you know, authors that are always surprised when they get fan mail. So this is such yeah. a great testament to, yeah, there are people reading your books and they're, 
the very personal experiences and they're connecting with them. So it's great that, yeah, you, it's just, you know, this invisible sea of people becomes very real and, you know, turns it into kind of, you know, your next action step in a way. Yeah. And, and in the old days, you know, I always say the old days, I feel like the grand dam sometimes of, of writing. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I I grew old. My children literally grew up, you know, with me doing this, and um, and it it's been interesting because now they're in their 30s, and I'm like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? But I think the one thing that saved me early on was the fact that I didn't have an expectation of anyone actually reading my book. When when you you um, approach it as a personal challenge, you know, which I did, which was like somebody said, I dare you. And I'm like, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> it I didn't have the, um, the, the feeling that anyone expected anything of me. In fact, they probably expected me to fail and it would be a good laugh and, and I'd just go back to working. And so I think that freed me a lot. Um, and I, I do think new writers can become absolutely paralyzed uh, with um, with the fear that, A, who's going to read it? B, if they read it, will they hate it? Will they think it's stupid? I hear that a lot, you know, that does, does it sound stupid? And, and the thing is, new writers have to realize, even as old hands at this, it doesn't come out perfect the first time. It just doesn't. I mean, I'm on my probably 10th edit of this full manuscript just to make sure that that the foundation of plot and story are correct and that the characters have consistent voices and and nobody does this right the first time and that's that's why I love to just you know give those new writers a check and say come on we're all doing the same thing it's it's going to be great you're going to you know free yourself a little bit let's go for it Excellent advice. And that's yeah, that covers one of my things is advice for for authors, and that's that's some really good stuff there. So, coming to our final question, of course, since you know this is your daily writing habit, I need to ask you, what are your most yeah, what are your most successful writing habits, whether daily or otherwise, that ha especially the habits that help you produce as many books as you do. Yeah, there and and I I love the title of your of your podcast because it is a daily writing habit. I am really a fan of um, being consistent. And I think this also came because I because I did work corporately and actually I've been working since I was 14. So I always had a boss and I always had, you know, an office to go to or, or someplace to go. And when I, I did transition over, I was trying to write at home and I realized this was not working for me. Um, and everybody has to find what works for them. So what works for me is to literally get dressed like I'm going to work. Now, I don't put on the heels and stockings anymore, I must admit, but I do put my makeup on and um, I take my computer and for 20 years I've been going to the same coffee shop. They are so sweet. They let me sit there for as long as I want and do my thing. Um, but I found I needed to get out, not have the solitude of home. I needed to have people around me not necessarily to talk to, but I needed the energy of life going on. So I do get dressed. I go to my coffee shop. I'm usually there about, oh, 7.30 in the morning, sometimes a little earlier. I write until maybe noon or 1. Um, and then it, I come home, do my chores. And in the evening, I'll answer fan mail. I'll do marketing. Um, for me, that really works is to be on a regular schedule. I, I do work Saturdays and Sundays um, a lot of times when I have a book coming out, but I only do it until, say, noon so that I have family time. But everybody has to find where it works for them. And what worries me about new writers is that sometimes they say, I can't, I have, you know, I have kids, I have a husband, I have this. Engage your family in what you're doing. My my biggest supporters are my family. I adore that. My husband will do the dishes when I early on, you know, he would really help out and he works a, a full time job and, and it's tough for him. But he he'd do a load of laundry. He'd do a couple of little things that really gave me an hour and a half in the evening to write. Um my kids were toddlers and I took an old typewriter put it on the floor behind my chair and it when it was time for me to write, I said it was time for them to write their books too. 
And so they I would wow. put paper in and they would they would bang on the typewriter and uh, I would bang on the typewriter. Yes, I started before computers. Oh. And uh, and and it made and then when a book sold I made sure to include the whole family in the celebration. You know, I mean, in the early days when I was making next to nothing, we would go to McDonald's and everybody got McNuggets because it was like expensive on the menu. And, and I think, I think those habits of inclusion, um, celebration, um, they, they make all the difference in the world. You don't need a huge village. You need your, close village to believe in you and you need to figure out which daily writing habits work for you maybe and don't beat yourself up if if you don't make it one day but when you're writing full-time I think you need to have at least for me I needed to have a true schedule to know what I was what I was supposed to do that day meet those goals and then come home and and I could uh you know, I could have a, a regular evening. So I didn't want writing to consume me any more than I wanted a corporate job to consume me. That's awesome. I love including your family, celebrate the things I didn't even think about. Yeah, like including, I'm thinking of how can I include my husband in my career celebrations now? He's always the one that actually um, encourages me, which is, and encourages me to oh. celebrate because I, you know me, Rebecca, at this point, we've been friends for so long of, you know, yeah. kind of a little bit of a work, kind of a type A workaholic, I guess I describe myself. I would, I would say <laughs> a tad, you know, I, I'm glad yeah. you labeled yourself and I didn't have to. So yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, we are very similar in, in those, in that way. Um, you are much more <laughs> prolific than I am in terms of all the different things you do. But you can see in how you plan for things that that's why what you offer is is so it's accessible and it's uh, it's meaningful to I mean you know I've been doing this so long and when I listen to your podcast it's like great you're pulling me back at a certain point and sometimes you're inspiring me at a certain point and that is really an incredible gift to give to authors or any creative person. Because we do tend to get manic. And I think that's why having had a work career and having that discipline really helps me not be as manic as I could be. But honestly, husbands, significant others, find the one voice who who encourages you and who will celebrate with you. Because the one thing that makes me saddest is when I hear people say, and I, I hear this a lot, that oh, you know, my my family thinks I'm being silly or my family doesn't think I can do it or my best friend says, don't be crazy, you know, nobody will read it. I, it, I, it, I cringe because then I want to be that voice for that person and say, you know what, I know it's going to be hard because the people closest to you aren't encouraging you, but please move forward. And, and I think your voice also helps people do that too. Um, best scenario is someone who is close to you saying, absolutely, I believe in you, because boy, is that the, the most wonderful thing you could ever hear is somebody saying, there are going to be people out there who will love your book. You know, that's all you need to hear. And then you're off to the races. And that is, like you're saying, that is such a blessing. And I've been blessed with so many encouraging voices, starting with my mom and then kind of like my husband kicked up the, <clears throat> excuse me, the relay race baton from my mom and he's carrying it forward after that. And I, I do realize very realistically, there's so many artists, uh, writers and, and artists in general that don't have that. So yeah, I consider it a complete privilege and honor to be able to be that voice for people that, you know, didn't, yep. they weren't raised by my mother and they're not married to my husband. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I do. I feel the exact same way. I really, when when somebody just, it, in fact, there's a lady in England that I, I encouraged and, you know, didn't think much of it and, and because it's something I just like to do. And now she's like seven books in and it's, and she is having a ball. Her husband's having a ball. Her husband hands out her cards on the train in Scotland. I love that. It's like, here, my oh. wife writes books. How cute is that? <laughs> oh, just, that's adorable. Oh, it it is so. Now my husband won't go that far. I must admit. In fact, I don't think he remembers the titles of my books, but he certainly 
he certainly makes it easy for me to write and and I will bless him for that forever but but yeah new writers out there please know that there are lots of voices who want to encourage you and and we're just two of them Absolutely. That's also why, and you've popped into my Ink Authors group on Facebook, and now I have it on LinkedIn as well. So some oh, people just aren't really Facebook. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Some people, oh. yeah, I've realized, you know, with Facebook's kind of issues over the years, a lot of people dropped off Facebook, and I still wanted to be able to provide that, you know, that group that has the resources and the support and the inspiration. So Ink Authors, you can find it on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, so I'll make sure that I, you know, get you in there on LinkedIn, Rebecca, because you've been so I great. Will, I will be one. there. I will be there for <laughs> sure. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. And I and I have to admit, I am sometimes um, befuddled by Facebook. I'm just, I'm actually just starting a street team, which I've never done before. And, and so I, I'm learning how to make a group over on Facebook. Maybe I may need to move over to LinkedIn. Who knows? I have no idea. I am so jealous of your ability to understand all this stuff. But meanwhile, while you're understanding it, I am over here writing books, and I figure you will guide me when I need to do something, something other than yeah. write. Please, please keep writing books. Please keep telling okay. us, you know, the Josie, the Josie stories. We'll, well, the rest of us will take care of the technology, and I'll be your street team, as you know, talking oh, about you here. Perfect. And yeah, make sure everybody, um, yeah, go ahead and go to Amazon and wherever books are, and pre-order Lost Witness coming December first. So awesome! As well as look up if you're a new fan of Rebecca's, especially after this episode, look up all the other Witness books because those and are. And we also have we also have a new series. I don't know if you know the Finn yeah. O'Brien series. Who I uh, yeah. yeah, Finn O'Brien, love him too. Um, it just you know. I just love that this is the kind of business that you can keep going and going and going. I'm going to be 100 years old and still writing Josie Bates, I think. <laughs> we all want you to. And that, that's why, yeah, the retirement conversations are funny because they're just like, why would I want to retire when I wake up in the morning at, at 6.30 in the morning? And I never was a morning person. I'm to the point now I jump out of bed at 6.30 and I'm just like, yep. oh, my God, I have a deadline today. This is awesome. <laughs> I am right there with you. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. You know, new writers, come and join us because this is more fun than, than you can ever imagine. It is. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. This There's so much. I have no idea how I'm going to promote this episode because there's so much stuff in it. <laughs> really, this is jam-packed with value. So, oh my gosh, you're a rock star. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And it's it's so nice to talk to you. I mean, get so involved in emails and texting and things that sometimes you forget there's there's a voice on the other end. So this was this was very special for me. And thank you for the invitation. You are so welcome, and thank you all for joining me, joining us here on Your Daily Writing Habit, where I'm helping you write and finish writing an awesome book, and if you know someone else who wants to do the same thing, please point them in the direction of the show. They can look up Your Daily Writing Habit on their Amazon Alexa device, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, ah, all the places where the podcasts are. <laughs> thank you, and until tomorrow, happy writing.